The Unshackled Waves, episode 154. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, good to have your company after this difficult past week. You would all be aware that anti-Islam and British values campaigner Tommy Robinson has been jailed for breaching a previous suspended sentence after being charged with breaching the peace for filming outside a Muslim gang grooming trial. And also the Republic of Ireland voted on Friday to legalise abortion in the previously pro-life nation. Back home, federal parliament was sitting and apart from some fiery exchanges in Senate estimates, the important Important developments where we finally got a date for the Super Saturday of five by-elections. It won't be held until July 28th. The federal government's company tax cuts were dealt a death blow after Pauline Hanson withdrew support, but the government for some reason is still persisting with them. To discuss it all, I'm joined once again by the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Michael, welcome again. Good to talk to you again, Tim. Now, you and me have been on the edge of our seats wanting to know when the Super Saturday of by-elections uh, will be. It's It's been dragged out for quite a while now, but uh, last Thursday, the Speaker of the House, Tony Smith, confirmed that the uh, five by-elections, four that were triggered by the uh, dual uh, citizenship uh, saga, will be on Saturday, July 28th, which... Coincidentally, it just happens to be the same day as the Labour Party National Conference. Uh, now, the uh, Ele Australian Electoral Commission, they can advise the, the government and the speaker about what uh, suitable dates for uh, by-elections, but at the end of the day, it's the, the government, and the speaker, at the end of the day, is a Liberal MP, uh, chose July 28, and the Labour Party is, of course, filthy, because it's really the ultimate... Uh, act of political trickery because or a uh, labor conference it's it's not going to be on the same day as the by-election they'll just uh, sim simply uh, move that but was the the government smart to to do this well i don't think it was really smart or dumb or anything like that to be honest tim because the labor party and the liberal party both of them they do tend to have their conventions in july regardless of um, election dates. It's a common thing for them. It's the beginning of their year, so to speak. In 2010, when the LNP had their state convention, it was on the week, same weekend that Gillard called the federal election in 2010. They then wrapped up the convention and went fully into campaign mode. So it's not necessarily a matter of political trickery as it is just a matter of convenience for whatever reason that Turnbull and the Liberal Party room think will be of most benefit to them. Now, the argument uh, for having these by-elections two, two, two months uh, from now is that uh, uh, the AEC needed time to fine-tune the citizenship disclosure process where I don't get what uh, because at the end of the day an MP can still sign the declaration to say they're complying with the, uh, the, the Constitution and uh, the, the other argument was that oh, the by-elections can't clash with uh, school holidays but given that uh, mo uh, most people vote early now uh, that that argument doesn't hold sway because if you uh, because if you're away for the the by-election date there's there's so many other ways uh, you can vote mm. well it's a bad move on the part of any political party to have an election during the school holidays because people like to go away for the school holidays they like to take their kids somewhere spend time with their children uh so they decide as a rule to either put it before or put it after the school holidays, notwithstanding the growth in pre-poll voting. As for the... Excuse me. Uh, as for the argument that the AC needed time to fine-tune the citizenship disclosure process, that's bluntly put, that's crap. This mm. is a political decision. This has nothing to do with the AEC, which is an independent statutory body. It's just because... 
the Liberal Party in regards to the um, candidates, because there was a supposed issue uh, for one of the candidates in one of the by-elections that he may have been entitled to uh, citizenship of Papua New Guinea. But based on a prima facie ruling of, um, sorry, prima facie reading rather, of the Papua New Guinea citizenship uh, laws, then that candidate, uh, Trevor Ruthenberg, for the seat of Longman would not be, would not fall foul of that. But there may be other candidates that had been pre-selected by the Liberal Party who may fall afoul of other citizenship laws. And given that the High Court made its decision to read Section 44 to the letter, it then becomes a matter of everyone has to be a lot more careful in filling out the forms. Because there are plenty of people who fill out the forms who are breaking the law and don't even know it. And and this was the argument that um, Barnaby Joyce used unsuccessfully in the court, amongst others. So it's not about fine-tuning the citizenship to clo- disclosure process. In my view, it's a cynical move by the Liberal Party to make sure pardon me, to make sure that their candidates are in the clear should they win, which the only one, the only seat that they look like having a chance of winning at this stage is Longman. But they they pre-selected their candidate for Longman last Tuesday. That uh, that doesn't justify delaying the by-elections for another two months. And Labor has made the point that these five seats will be without representation uh, for that time. Of course, the the coalition they they like the fact that Labor will be three seats short in the House of Representatives. They won't uh, <laughs> have any embarrassing moments where uh, a few of their MPs are off uh, somewhere and and miss a vote on the on the on the. Floor floor of parliament and it was it was made the point was made by paul murray that uh uh the coalition they've given bill shorten the ultimate get out of jail free free card with the national conference he's he can now cancel it and avoid all those embarrassing uh ship fights over uh boats and uh, as we saw uh, with the victorian uh, state conference this weekend uh, uh changing the date of uh, australia day i mean labor had a horror week with uh uh, on the asylum seeker issue with uh, Jed Carney's maiden speech uh, decrying uh, our uh, asylum seeker offshore processing uh, policy and then Linda Burney saying there should be a time limit and then thinking that she could doctor a transcript uh, which we all knew that there was video evidence of her saying something else. Mm. Well, there's a lot of stuff that is not recorded in Parliament, but there is also everything else that is recorded, especially on Hansard. And of course, as you point out, the electronic records remain regardless of what people like Bernie decide to say that they said or replicate or fabricate what they said in her case. Um... Look, the the electorate's going for two months without representation. is It's pretty poor form for democracy. I, if I had been Turnbull, I would not have done that. But there was the suggestion, and I made it to you both privately and publicly, that Turnbull could be doing a Fraser, waiting for the time to be right to declare a general election rather than waiting for the by-elections to be resolved because by-elections cost a lot of money and who forks that who forks the bill for that we the taxpayers we fork the money out for that um yes it does help them that they've got um three less opposition mps to worry about for the time being but at the same time it's not really going to impact the government's agenda that much it's more just a It's more just a stick it to Shorten and the ALP, although Shorten is facing a few problems of his own, it should be noted, not just with the horror week that you alluded to, but also his own personal standing. More and more people are starting to make noises about Albo, sorry, Anthony Albanese um, taking over. Mm. And while that's not likely to happen, given Rudd's changes to the rules in 2013 when he was restored to the prime ministership, it's 
not going to let Shorten sleep easy at night. Uh, Bill Shorten's still got the, the numbers uh, stitched up. Uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to speculate that there's going to be any change. I think Bill Shorten will be the, the leader to the uh, next election. And uh, you're right. Oh, of course he will. Yeah, of course yeah. he will. I mean, when he was, as you remember, when he was elected leader of the Labor Party, he won on the back of caucus, yes. not on the back of the rank and file. The rank yeah. and file, I think, was 75% or something like no, that. No, it wasn't that high. I think it was about 60-40 uh, for... Uh, Albanese and Shorten made sure that he got uh, got got enough in caucus, getting uh, some of the left faction to to back his leadership, and oh, you know the the numbers ended up in his favour. Mm, wow, gee, there's a shock. If there's something Bill Shorten is good at doing, it's stacking. I mean, that's how he got into Parliament in the first place. He rolled a sitting MP, but that's another discussion for another time. Uh. The coalition, the the only real chance they've got is in Longman. Braddon, they've got a somewhat of a uh, a chance, but uh, it's been talked about in the media that no government has won a by election from the opposition since uh, around 1920. So yeah, they Turnbull's definitely. If these by elections go well, he yeah he will definitely rush off and go to a general election. He could do that, but that would be dangerous for him as well. Uh, John Howard actually wrote about something like that in his um, biography, or autobiography that was ghostwritten for him, Lazarus Rising, uh, talking about being fooled by Flinders, where there was actually a seat that was actually won by the government. Um, or sorry, it was won by the Liberal Party when they weren't expecting it to happen. And the people decided to take that as a sign that, oh, we can destroy them. At that we could destroy Labor at the next election, but it didn't go down that way, obviously. Um, so Longman is, you're right, Longman is the only electric really in play here. I mean, Braddon, maybe, but I'm more, because I'm in Queensland, I'm the next seat over from Longman, so I can actually say that it will be very, very tight, and two party preferred. Because One Nation is running um, a candidate, and they expect and they are expecting fifteen percent of the primary vote. I'm not as optimistic as One Nation and their advisors. I would estimate between eight and twelve percent, to be honest. But the interesting thing about the Longman by-election is that the Australian Country Party, which was formed in Victoria uh, after merging with the Victorian branch of Catters Australia Party has gone nationwide and is starting to consider running candidates. In fact, they're considering a candidate to run in Longman now. Now, what this will mean, this will be a wild card. It may end up being nothing, but it could end up being something depending on depending on whom they pre-select to um, campaign. Uh, they could have, they are the front runner for um, the for the um, candidacy of pre-selection for the city of Longman with the ACP is Brad Kennedy, who ran for Caddis Australia Party in 2016 and got a would have gotten a much, much larger share of the vote had One Nation not been uh, resurgent as it was at the time. So there is a possibility that the One Nation preferences will get... Um, diminished, but at the end of the day, at this stage, it doesn't look like they will be um, impacted too heavily by uh, any other minor parties or any independents, at least not at this stage. One Nation leader Pauline Hansen withdrew her support for the uh, coalition's signature policy, the uh, company tax cuts. She argued that the government had failed to deliver on her demands, including reducing immigration, building a coal-fired power station in North Queensland, lowering spending and an apprenticeships uh, pilot program. She claimed that she hadn't uh, bro broken a word. She's, she said that the government had uh, broken their end of the, the bargain. Um, most people, uh, most commentators, uh, 
interpreted this as uh, Pauline Hanson wanting to differentiate herself from the uh, the coalition because there's that statistic that she votes with them 70% uh, uh, of the time and it appeared that uh, support for the tax cuts was dying, especially with the uh, Banking Royal Commission uh, air airing all, all of the uh, uh, goings on at the at the banks screwing over small business people and uh, of course uh, retirees and Pauline Hanson uh, just by coincidence visited the Banking Royal Commission that week to uh, try and I, I would say reconnect with the uh, working class. Now the, the government is still trying to persevere uh, with these uh, tax cuts wanting to get them past the, the Senate and is still willing to campaign on them. It's not surprising that Pauline would actually withdraw her support for company tax cuts. After all, her her priority is, you know, not just gaining votes, but also having the support of the working class, as it were. There is a lot of, there is a high burden of taxation on the individual as well. Her withdrawal of support from company tax cuts, forward company tax cuts rather, could be seen as a cynical man manoeuvre and... You know, I mean, I'm as cynical as they come, but in fan, <clears throat> pardon me, in fairness to Pauline, she has been criticised by me and by several others in the past for not using her position in the Senate, her power in the Senate to influence government policy for the betterment of the country. And given her argument that the government, given her argument that the government has failed to deliver on her demands, most of which would have been the agreement to which would have been conditions of her supporting certain policies in the past. It's it's not surprising that she would do this now. You know, credit where credit is due. Pauline, I'm actually supporting Pauline on this simply because of the fact that She's made demands. The government has reneged on them time and time again. The government has broken their word to her. And I don't like saying that, but they have. And, you know, she's not asking for that much. She's actually not asking for that much at all. As for the visit to the Royal Commission, it's just, you know, I mean, it's it makes sense that she would visit them, not just for from a political point of view, but also from a personal point of view. I mean, before Jeff Cullerton went went rogue and or was disqualified depending on how you want to look at it she was very concerned about banking matters and as a result you'd look at it and think well of course she's going to be paying attention to it i mean the liberals as we discussed the liberals are furious because they've been made to look like fools by the big banks pauline hansen as a former small business owner has been following from a distance and then in some cases outright attending to gain a better idea of what is really going on and what could be done to fix the problem. Uh, and of course, Labour, they loving the fact that uh, the coalition still wants to pass these uh, company tax cuts. I, I mean, it, it's part of Bill Shorten's class warfare strategy and at the uh, Labor, uh, state Labour conference in Victoria, he gave a Oh, a screaming speech where uh, you know talk, talked about the multi-billion-dollar uh, tax giveaway to uh, corporations. Yeah, unfortunately for Shorten or Mr. Harborside Mansion, as I believe it was Peter Credlin who called him originally. Um, no, she called Turnbull and Shorten both Mr. Harborside Mansions. Yeah, they, um, Shorten's not, not doing too bad financially either. Yeah, it, 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 it's a bit galling when, you, when you're when you a working class person and you see some snobby lawyer in a suit railing about class warfare, pretending to be one of them when he's clearly not. It's not, it's underwhelming. I mean, you know, most of the people I've spoken to in the Labour Party, they weren't overly impressed lefties will always get behind their leaders it's the whole cult of personality thing it's the collective mentality the the hive mind the herd mentality whatever you want to call it um but like i said tim the speech did not go down that well with them for the reasons of you know 
guy, a, a snobby lawyer in a suit, um, dressed to the nines, lecturing working class people about how he cares about them. They're not going to buy that. They'll only get behind him because he's better than the alternative in their eyes. Now, there was... Now, the perception is uh, by the, the media uh, is that these company tax cuts are toxic, but there was a news poll uh, this week that showed there was 63% support uh, for the tax cuts. And now Pauline Hanson is saying, oh, maybe uh, I'll support them again. Uh, and she's inviting the public to uh, l let, uh, let her know what, what they think. Hmm. Well, if I were to say anything about it, I'd say, look, company tax cuts need to be delayed. Not because I wouldn't delay tax cuts. I think company tax cuts are a good thing. But we need to delay them realistically simply because of the fact we can't afford to reduce our revenue receipts more than we already have. Yeah, there are some in the well, some liberal backbenchers and especially in the, the National Party who, who are saying to the... Uh, the the liberals look you uh, you should just you know admit defeat on this uh, bank the the savings uh, to to pay off the debt or uh, spend on lower to, to middle income tax cuts but of course the problem with the whole uh, tax package is it's staggered over a decade I mean uh, they don't even know where they whether they're going to be in government uh, by the by the end of this year I right? and <laughs> why uh, why do they have to be staggered for for, for so many years I mean you know it's, it's like the old you know communist you know five ten year plan <laughs> hey you said it not me but um it's dangling the, it's dangling the carrot to them Tim it's dangling the carrot to the electorate hoping that the electorate's gonna be optimistic enough to buy into the government's unfounded optimism about the, but the, the public economy. wants things now like they're, they're not uh, they're not gonna say uh, hang around for oh i'll re-elect you because you know i trust that you're gonna you know do this in three years time yeah people put people if people trust politicians blindly then they're idiots put it that's that's basically the way i'd sum it up Uh, but the the government will be confident that they can get the the numbers in the Senate because uh, uh, they've managed to well the National Party has managed to get uh, Steve Martin who uh, was elected as Jackie Lambie's replacement he was kicked out of the Jackie Lambie network on his first day because he refused to uh, vacate his seat to let Jackie Lambie back in he's joined the National Party which means that uh, the <laughs> government they only need eight out of the ten crossbenchers now and this adds to uh lucy uh Gucci, i think i've uh, pronounced her name gachui who uh joined the the liberal party of uh, i think it was uh, end of end of last year uh so they've uh, well, one thing that uh, the the Turnbull government is doing better than the Abbott government is not just wooing over the cross benches, but getting them over to their side of politics as part as uh, sitting MPs. Mm. Although that's more incidental in regards to the egos of the leaders of their former parties. That's what it comes down to. I mean, Jackie Lambie got upset because Senator Martin wouldn't step aside for her. Um, Lucy, uh, Senator Gachui left, um, well, actually, she didn't leave Family First. Family First left her when they merged with these drunk conservatives. Yeah, they don't then, exist anymore. And then she said, well, I was, I was a senator for Family First, not for Australian conservatives. And given the fact that uh, Corey Bernardi would have been number one on the Senate ticket regardless... She probably would have thought herself, well, I might as well be an independent, and then, oh, well, I can't really win as an independent, so I might as well be a liberal. So, you know, I mean, I don't know the, I don't know the entirety of her thinking behind that, but I can understand to an extent why she did it, why she joined the liberals. Well, the Nationals, they ha now have uh, someone in Tasmania now, which uh, they, they've never uh, had before, so that, that gives them a foot... Uh, in a, in another state, and of course the the nationals have been fighting a uphill battle for the last uh, twenty five years to maintain their 
their, their representation and it's also a coup for uh, Michael McCormack as, as leader who's uh, got big shoes to, uh, to fill. So yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly a win for the Nationals and the, uh, and the Coalition. It will make their job a bit uh, easier. A little bit easier, but they still have to negotiate with the crossbench. Just because the crossbench the crossbench has diminished in numbers doesn't mean that the crossbench isn't still a wild card, qualitatively speaking. I don't think it'll help them that much, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it's one less vote that they have to win, but they still have to they still have to deal with One Nation. They still have to deal with the Greens. They still have to deal with. Um, Bernardi, Lionhelm, and um, Senator Fraser Anning in Queensland. So all this does really is it doesn't really change the fact that One Nation will essentially hold a balance of power in conjunction with Bernardi, Lionhelm, and Anning. All it does is just that it makes it one vote less. That's all it is. It's just one vote less. I mean, it looks good on paper that they've had this success, but it's just opportunism on the part of the, the senators in question, to be frank. Now, we'll move on to the, the bad news of the week. And uh, Tommy Robinson, who's uh, arguably the UK's most prominent uh, anti-Islam and uh, British values uh, campaigner, he was uh, arrested for uh, live streaming outside the, the court of a Muslim uh, gang grooming trial in, in Leeds. He was charged with uh, breaching the peace. Now, he was already on a suspended sentence for uh, contempt of court for covering a another grooming trial there's there's so many of these in the the, the uk so he was summarily sentenced by a, uh, a judge to 13 months in prison and the judge also suppressed a, a reporting on uh this uh, on tommy robinson's sentencing until the grooming trial uh concludes uh, now, uh, this has been labelled a death sentence for Tommy Robinson because there's plenty of uh, Muslims in jail who, who would you know, love to beat him to a, uh, a pulp. And it, it seems and now a lot of people are saying that, yeah, uh, well, he definitely is a political prisoner and this is you know, what a, a fascist state does. They're, it's technically a legal jailing, but the charges, of course, are, are, are trumped up, so it's not quite that uh, Tommy Robinson's disappeared in the middle of the night and nobody's ever going to hear from him again but there's been outrage in the United Kingdom there's been outrage here there's uh, there was a rally uh, yesterday uh, in Melbourne and Canberra there's there's one happening this morning in Auckland New Zealand it's it's really angered uh, people that uh, the UK they they're based they've basically jailed someone for uh, reporting on you know a group of pedophiles mm -hmm. and this is the issue this is the issue tim it's a suppression of communi political communication it's a suppression of free speech it's a suppression of liberty in general and i had a friend of mine who's a member of the liberal party who's not he's not really what the lefties would call islamophobic at all not by any stretch but he actually sent me the uh, clip to the live stream where Tommy Robinson was being arrested and he actually said this is absolutely tyrannical this is a friend of mine this is someone that you know alt-right hardliners would call a normie and he is saying this the fact that you've got Malcolm Roberts, Avi Yemeni so many others all mobilizing and marching spontaneously in protest against his jailing I mean yeah, it's not technically our country, but at the same time, expressing solidarity is a desirable thing. But I digress. The option, the the option taken by the government to uphold the letter of the law to suppress the spirit of the law is extremely troubling. Now, the trial that he that he was held in a matter of hours breach of the peace can technically under the law be adjudicated by a magistrate so there's no 
there's no like you said there's no technical legal issue with how he was jailed but it was a the the charges weren't technically trumped up either but they were an abuse of the spirit of the law yeah and the thing i mean was, uh but it's a breach of the peace i mean that's uh you know you can the the, the police can argue that any type of you know public activism is that yeah i could smoke at a bus stop and be guilty of breach of the peace you know you could you know you could i mean you don't smoke but you could smoke at a bus stop for example and get done for breach of the peace breach of the peace is a very it's very rare for anyone to be charged with breaching the peace i mean you know there's so many cases by the logic used in the case of tommy robinson you should be charging a whole lot more people worldwide for breaching the peace you know causing a public nuisance that's breaching the peace you know marching through the streets without a permit to protest that's breaching the peace you know being drunk and disorderly that's breaching the peace you know you, you can go on i could go on all day i won't because we've got limited time the point is this is the thing that bothers me the most about this it wasn't the rapidness of the trial it was the fact that the trial was closed to the public and the gag order on reporting on not only tommy robinson's trial but any other grooming trial for that matter has been suppressed it should be suppressed in the first place they didn't suppress it before they wait until after they got him on a technicality to put the gag order out like come on do they honestly think a trial in process with a jury already being appointed is going to prejudice the outcome of the trial no it's not tommy robinson is a political prisoner and i i hate to say that because we don't like to think of england the home of democracy as being a police state but it is now and god help england god help us if we ever get to that stage yeah i mean uh, the conservative government in the uk they, they've announced uh, uh, a far-right uh, crackdown that uh, and they've declared islamophobia a form of extremism i mean this has br been brewing for a while they uh, jail people for mean you know comments on the on the internet I, it's yeah i i uh, you know wasn't so much alarmed by this but uh you know i i more just thought well you know <laughs> this was coming and yeah it's good that um well because tommy robinson he's easily the most uh, effective anti-islam campaigner uh, in europe he's a he's a civic uh nationalist he, his concern mm. is with the the ideology of islam uh he he's been on you know all the the mainstream media channels you know making his case well against some you know pretty uh, i'd say ferocious uh, qu uh questioning and yeah and he's also you know not afraid to you know confront these you know, uh, grooming gangs uh, out, out outside of court uh, uh, it's 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 pretty gutsy that he goes up and you know calls them you know filthy muslim pedos i mean <laughs> you know that, that that takes quite a bit of uh, courage and recently he was uh he, he was able to fend off some antifa uh soy boys so uh yeah he he's he, he's he's been very effective and yeah it's uh, it's not surprising of course it is uh, it, it is an outrage that you know he's basically been taken uh off the street but yeah the uk government they're they're not going to to get away with this he's got a worldwide following that uh the the suppression order that can't shut down the entire internet i mean the unshackled has been reporting on it and we've you know named uh, you know tommy Rob the fact that tommy robinson's been uh jailed so you know, if you, you, you can't do this in the internet age. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Unfortunately, Tim, it's not going to help him if, God forbid, something happens to him in prison. There, there's a powder keg that's going to go off. I mean, you're going to have a lot of people who are much more extreme than Tommy losing their temper, losing their patience, and things are going to get very ugly over there. The fact that they've already done this the sign that the police state of the uk has already done this is a sure sign that it's a sure sign that things are just going to get much much worse i mean lauren southern was banned from ever entering the uk again and now tommy robinson has been you know jailed for 
just for doing his job, basically, just doing a report on, just for doing a job on, you know, reporting, you know, or something that's in the public interest. It's in the public interest to know that grooming offences that have taken place over the past two or three decades, it's in the public interest for us to know this. Why shouldn't we be told about this? Why shouldn't we be informed about this? That should be the real story. I mean, not Tommy Robinson got put in jail. This is just, that's just a diversion from the fact. So while we're all worked up about Tommy Robinson, our rage, our righteous rage, is being diverted from the fact that these pedophiles have been hurting and abusing children for God knows how long. Yeah, I mean, there should be a royal commission into it. I mean, a uh, Rotherham and Telford. A royal commission won't do anything. Though. Well, yeah, I'm saying if you're going to have one into the Catholic Church and other institutions, like you should be having one here because this is mm. going on in the present. I mean, uh, Rotherham and Telford are the two most uh, horrendous uh, examples. I mean, the fact mm. that this goes on in a Western country in this modern age, where you know, where uh, we're supposed to be, you know, aware of the dangers of of sexual predators. Uh, it's 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 just stuns me mm. it's it's too depressing it's too depressing to even think about mm. and the fact that the uk government has enabled these atrocities these crimes against humanity to happen to the children that live there i mean there are going to be a lot of people on judgment day who will have a lot to answer for i can tell you right now well Tommy Robinson, he was previously uh, bashed by um, Muslims in, in when he was uh, in prison for mortgage fraud, fraud offences. Uh, uh, thankfully, he was put in a more secure um, prison. So we hope that the, the UK authorities are not that callous where they you know, just sit back and let him be uh, beaten to, to death. But yeah, we're, we're definitely, he's in our thoughts. All the, all the time, Tommy, and yeah, if you're religious, uh, pray for Tommy. Mm, indeed. Oh, well, it wasn't a good uh, weekend uh, across the, the British uh, Isles. The, the Republic of Ireland wrote it to repeal their, the Eighth Amendment to their constitution, which uh, gave uh, equal uh, protection to both the mother and the, the unborn child. It was uh, sixty-six point four percent of voters voted yes. Uh, Thirty-three point two percent voted no, and there was a sixty-four uh, voter turnout. Uh, it it was replaced uh, this uh, amendment by the thirty-sixth amendment, which uh, permits the the Irish Parliament to legislate for abortion. Uh, it was uh, this referendum was supported by all four parties in Ireland and its Prime Minister Leo uh, Vadikar. Uh, polling in the uh, sh uh, leading up to it showed the vote would be close, but it was the opposite in the end, which seemed to be it was the reverse of the shy for uh, Tory factor, the fact that uh, many Irish, they didn't want to tell uh, a pollster that they supported abortion, but in the, the privacy of the ballot booth uh, voted uh, yes. And of course, the media spin was, oh, this was a historic vote completing Ireland's revolution to uh, a secular nation, but uh, as the reality is, Ireland goes from having the uh, what I would say are the, the perfect laws to protect the unborn to basically be on the path to abortion on demand right up until birth. Mm, indeed, indeed. Um, and that's the thing, Tim. This is why I, when you asked me if I was interested in writing an article on this, I had to decline because I would not say anything. I would not be able to remain impartial. This actually really angers and upsets me. The Eighth Amendment protected the right of the unborn, except in cases of endangering the health of the mother. Or the life the, of the mother. The life of the mother. Sorry, the life of the mother. You are correct. Um, this 36th Amendment. You said the 36th Amendment, I think? Yeah. 36th. Yes, that's right. It's now going to give the Parliament... Um, the ability to um, legislate for abortion on a whim, basically. Um, one thing that, well, <clears throat> this is this is even the thing that bugs me the most. Looking at the figures that I viewed yesterday, there was only a 64% voter turnout for the referendum. 
Now, I, I don't know much about, actually, I don't know anything about the Irish constitution, except they call their prime minister Taoiseach or something instead of prime minister, technically. But 64% of the voters turned out. 66.4% of those voted yes. So, hang on. So what? Two thirds of two... Th- Two thirds of less than two thirds. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, that, uh, that that sort of technical numbers game. I mean, Irish votes. Th- this was the same argument made after their same-sex marriage vote, which had about a 62% turnout. I mean, yeah, I, but I, I, but Ireland. Okay, yeah, sorry, but uh, ours was a plebiscite. Ireland had a Ireland had a referendum. A constitution I'm just saying. Referendum. I'm I'm just saying that I uh, that Ireland's turnout for for referendums is only always about this 60% mark. God, that's depressing. <sighs> Sorry. Anyway, um, there is one thing that should be commented on here. Uh, the media saying it's a historic vote, completing the revolution of Ireland to being a secular nation. Ireland was always a secular nation. Amen de Valera, who, by the way, is turning in his grave at this result supported the separation of church from the state. He was a socialist, but even he would have said no to this. Even he would have voted no to this. All the parties that voted for this, especially Sinn Féin, should be ashamed of themselves for supporting this. Um, England, um, England was very much, when they occupied Ireland, was very much uh, established in the sense of persecuting the Catholics. The Irish Free State, then, which then became the Republic of Ireland, was very keen to make sure that they did not make the same mistakes. They didn't persecute Protestants when they became independent. They didn't persecute any more religious minorities when they became independent. But now they're saying, oh, Ireland's now a secular nation as a result of this Eighth Amendment. Crap. It's crap. They've always been a secular nation. It's just overtly secular now instead of being subtly and implicitly secular. And uh, yeah. one of the things that depressed me the most, and it really bugged me, during the campaign, you had this woman screaming at a rally, and I quote, hoes need abortions. Hoes need abortions. Hoes need abortions, unquote. She looked possessed. You could see the white in her eyes. Yeah. You could well, see, uh, when, she looked uh, like she was possessed. The, the news coverage of the of, of the result, I mean, yeah, it was pretty horrendous to see, you know, all these people cheering for, oh, yeah, now um, mothers can kill their unborn child. And of course, the, the women that they focused on were your typical, uh, you know, f- feminist hairstyles and, and, and body shapes. They even exist in Ireland. Mm, they do. But as I was saying, that that freak, that disgusting rally that they had where they were yelling out those chants that I mentioned before, it was just, it was horrific. And you think, don't you have any value of life? Do you want to dilute your demographics? I'd make some snark, you know, if I were, if I were a racist, far right, hardline nationalist, I make the comment, oh, there goes the neighborhood now because they need to dilute their demographics with further immigration. But at this rate, there's not gonna be anyone left in Ireland too have a neighborhood anyway and that's the saddest thing about it and with at the risk of sounding like i'm getting into conspiracy theories here there was some mention a little while ago about referenda and or plebiscites being introduced and being voted on if they weren't passed the first time they would be have another referendum or plebiscite later on until the powers that be got the result that they wanted so even if even if the church had actually stepped up and been the church and campaigned oh yeah catholic church it. were pretty much silent all through all throughout yeah they did nothing they failed to shepherd their sheep but that's an entirely different matter altogether i'm very angry and upset at the at the irish catholic church but that's another matter entirely and not probably for this podcast but every referendum and plebiscite that they have and if the powers that be don't like the result they'll say oh let's have another one so even if the catholic church had actually stepped up and said no we are going to oppose this then and had and had managed to secure a defeat of the vote to repeal amendment eight 
there would have been another referendum in a few years' time anyway. But it's – and now we're going to get – I think it was you who wrote the article on it. We're going to go down that slippery slope now where we're not going to just have abortions – for health reasons even we're going to have abortions on demand abortions on a whim just because oh i was careless last night or my boyfriend doesn't want me to have the baby or my husband doesn't want me to have the baby that's uh, what we're going to get to now yeah all oh, right it'll hurt my bank balance uh raising it'll hurt my bank balance, yeah people being selfish and, the, and as i said before the demographics are going to be diluted because islands po islands population is going to plummet that's well, already, already tiny yeah exactly Exactly right. And, you know, the demographics have already, they're already at zero or negative population growth. Their fertility rate is certainly well below replacement rate. And now they've got this. The only reason their population is so stable, relatively speaking, is because of immigration from uh, Europe in European countries and other countries. But, you know, with abortion on demand, fewer and fewer people will have children. They're going to need more and more um, immigrants to fill the void of um, depleted demography, and then you know, and then they'll they'll assimilate, and then they'll also go the same way. So when I say there goes the neighbourhood, I'm not saying in the sense of oh dear, look at those people coming in. I'm saying in the sense of there goes the neighbourhood because the neighbourhood is just going to disappear. And of course, now that islands are uh, fallen, this uh, strengthens the pro-abortion movement worldwide. They'll move on to trying to repeal uh, laws to protect the unborn in Latin America and the, uh, the Philippines, which are also uh, Catholic uh, majority nations. And of course, they'll try to uh, suppress pro-life speech even further. I mean, uh, we already have uh, exclusion zones outside abortion clinics in Victoria and Tasmania. It looks like it's going to happen in, in New South Wales. I mean, it's going to and get it's going to happen in Queensland as well. Yeah, it's going, it's going to get to the point, like, forward. not only do we have to tolerate the fact that there's babies being killed on every, every single day, but we're going to be restricted from doing anything to save them. Mm, exactly. And the thing is, and you know, it ties into the thing we were talking about Tommy Robinson before, but it's not just Tommy Robinson, it's Bernard Gaynor, it's um, Jada Franson, who was a confederate of Tommy Robinson, I believe as well. Um, uh, people who, Lauren Southern, um, Milo Yiannopoulos, Ian Hersey Ali, uh, the list goes on. You know, free speech is consistently under attack, but these, what makes this defeat the victory of the um, 36th Amendment over the 8th Amendment so dangerous is the fact that they're actually saying this president of suppressing free speech is here to stay deal with it there is nothing you can do we will use the power of the law to suppress the spirit of the law and with it your free speech god help us all to be honest tim god help us all uh, it's certainly uh, dark times in the the british isles uh, at least uh well thanks again michael for coming on discussing what's been a difficult uh, news week we hope that uh the news doesn't get any uh, worse, but it's just a sign of times that we're living in. Mm, indeed. Well, thank you for having me, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, if you haven't heard the big news already, it was announced on the weekend that Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern are touring Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events, and you should all grab your tickets ASAP at axomatic.events. Mainstream media is already triggered by the announcement, so it, they are sure to make some waves while they are here. The No Snowflakes pub night is happening this Friday, 1st of June, and is hosted by Arby Yemini and Sydney Watson. It starts at 7pm and will be held in the South Yarra area. 
Tickets are free and can be booked via Eventbrite. The True Blue Cruise annual Aussie Pride Flag March is nearly upon us. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there this year. The date is Sunday the 24th of June at 12pm and begins at the Royal Exhibition Building. The Campaign Against Racism and Fascism will be there to counter-protest, so we will witness the feral left in action. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash theunshackled. Also, don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.